you say, Vikas, that you're comfortable doing the same and continuing to allocate towards China in uh, 2024. Just walk us through why. Well, we continue to see opportunities on a bottom-up basis across Asia, mm -hmm. but in these three markets in particular. And we are aware of what is happening in the market. We try to be cognizant of what is driving the market, but we don't invest in the market, as we've talked about for several years now. We, we invest in companies. And when we look at China, and we look at the consumer, the domestic consumer sector, when we look at factory automation, when we look at renewables and the, the EV supply chain, beyond the OEMs, we see a lot of opportunities still. Japan had a good year last year, especially in the first half. The currency is strengthening a little bit, but we see a lot of bottom-up opportunities there. We still feel like we're in the very early innings of a long-term cycle of corporate governance reform and re-rating, coupled with continued double-digit earnings growth expectations. And then you come into India, and there continue to be very long-term opportunities there. We still think on a multi-year basis, in local currency terms, it's probably the one that's going to perform best. But there are clearly some pockets of that market that have gone from pricey to expensive. Now, you could have said that in June, after the rally from March to June and July last year, but that has continued. And what, what are we told when we look at markets and companies? Stocks follow earnings. There haven't been very many earnings upgrades in India in many sectors. IT services is one. That sector has seen a lot of outperformance. Consumer staples is another one. You have companies that have gone from 40 to 50 times earnings to now 60 to 80 times earnings without much in the way of multiple expansion. And those are two areas where we are underweight. And so there's, there's the election as well to con contend with. If I just return to China briefly, yes. uh, Martin and I have talked about this uh, consistently in 2023, and that is, are there valuation slash distressed opportunities in, let me get out, let me get this out of my system and say in, in China property, or is it still a no-go zone? It's not entirely a no-go go zone, but mm. I can tell you where we are spending our time and where we're not spending our time. We have not prioritized that sector. We are aware of what's going on, given the importance and the ramifications and all the concentric circles you can draw around that sector and, and the implications for other sectors. But it's not an area where we've allocated much capital. Now, derivatives of housing, some of the e-commerce platforms that benefit from transactions in that space, that is where we are exposed. But the core property sector, you draw some circles around that for financials, for construction infrastructure. We are less positioned there than we have been in many years. What about Japan? I mean, the thing I'm thinking is <clears throat> it was a uh, very hot market last year, obviously, right? Uh, if and when, or as and when, rather, the BOJ starts normalizing, rates go up there, uh, theoretically, it should be potentially negative for the market, no? Or are you thinking more, when rates start going up, a lot of Japanese money is going to be repatriated. It's already begun, I think, right? And you just ride that flood, that wave. Some of the Japanese money will come back. The, there is a lot on the sidelines. That's one part of it. Second, rates going up. We saw this in, in 2022, in December 22, the surprise budget decision. And if you look at how small caps reacted in particular, there's a lot of volatility there. But it set us up well for returns for the next 12 months. And I think if we see that again, given what we see on the earnings front, bottom up, given what we see on the top down corporate governance reform, I think that will open up opportunities for us again. What was very interesting about Japan last year is the divergence between value and growth and how strong value was actually and how strong large liquid names were and how the uh, growth small cap, mid cap names trailed a lot of the other parts of the market. Mm. So the good thing about Japan, the good thing about China, the good thing about India, you have these markets that have hundreds if not thousands of companies that are in the investable universe. And the market will do its thing. But when you look at the dispersion within that, even uh, across the market within sectors, there's a lot of opportunities, and which is why we, we per continue to prioritize these three markets. Hi, I'm Emily Tan, and thanks for watching CNBC. You can check out more of our videos by clicking on the boxes on the screen. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more. Thanks for watching.